J'ai maintenant le plaisir d'inviter sur scène Laurent Cérulus, qui est le chef de la rubrique Cybersécurité à Politico Europe, pour un échange avec Karl Oscar Bollin, ministre de la Défense civile suédois. Laurent Cérulus. Merci beaucoup, Adrien. Hello to all joining us here in the room in Lille and joining us online via live stream. I am Lauren Cyrillus. I am a cybersecurity editor at Politico in Europe. I edit our daily newsletter uh, on cybersecurity policy and politics in Europe called Cyber Insights. I have the pleasure of welcoming our next guest, uh, who is Mr. Karl Oskar Bolin on stage. Welcome, Minister. If I may introduce you, you are the Minister of Civil Defense for the government of Sweden. Um, and to some that might sound like a, a, a new portfolio or an exceptional portfolio, in fact, it might even be a unique portfolio uh, sitting within the Ministry of Defense that looks at how to prepare Swedish society for events like an armed attack um, or cyber attacks and so on. I wanted to say, because it is not a common portfolio, I wanted to start with asking you, can you just talk us through the thinking of the Swedish government in creating this portfolio and in giving you the responsibility uh, to take care of this task? Thank you, thank you very much. And I will, I will do my, my very best to do so. So <clears throat> this portfolio has come about as the new government took office in October last year mainly for two reasons. First of all, the dire security situation that we are no, um, everyone uh, right now um, uh, in. And second of all, uh, and the deterioration of the security situ situation. And second of all, this new government's ambition to reinstitute the total defense in Sweden. Because we have to look back towards where Sweden is coming from. We uh, our, uh, we have our uh, specific geogra geographic location and along with our uh, non-alignment policy that we had back during the Cold War, Sweden had very much to rely on, on itself. So we built one of the most thoroughly and thought through uh, systems within the civil defense, basically with two aims. The first one to keep society going uh, during very harsh circumstances ultimately under an armed attack and second of all to funnel all of society's efforts to support our, our uh, military forces and today we are aiming to uh, build back that total defense uh, policy that we that we once had and in the middle of this stands one new factor namely uh, the cyber domain which is stretching over the whole of society's uh, resilience. And so the, the, the very short answer to this complex question is, is, of course, that no society is stronger than its uh, weakest link. Because the weakest links, the weakest link are the ones that will be, that will be um, uh, put under aggression from an adversary or an antagonist. And that is wh why we I think whole of Europe needs to, to have a, a whole of society approach in building new uh, resilient societies. And that is what we're aiming to do with this portfolio. And if I may ask, because uh, you start job in October, so it's, uh, um, uh, it, yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of uh, fact finding and mapping of, of threats and, and, and challenges. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your priorities that you're seeing right now? Because if we talk about resilience, obviously that can go into a lot of different domains. Um, and my question is, where do you see the biggest challenge right now for a country like Sweden? Well, I think Sweden is no exception. I mean, we face the same challenges that the rest of, of, of Europe do, but I think that everyone needs to look on this in a new perspective in regards to, for example, what is happening in Ukraine right now. They have done their lessons in 2014. They have built robustness into the civil part of their society, stretching all the way from 
civil protection and rescue services over to, to uh, uh, resilience in the, in the cyber domain and handling that very well and efficiently. And of course, in the center of all this stands also, of course, energy supply. And Europe has this past year learned the hard way that energy can be weaponized and will be weaponized by an ad adversary if it is possible to do so. So we have to strengthen uh, autonomy, build redundance in every civil sector in order to create a greater resilience in society. And in Sweden, we are not starting from zero because we have the institutional memory of where we came from and what we've done from before. And we have a lot of um, volunteer organizations as well, and I think it's very important to engage them as well. And I, I brought to this table uh, a brochure that was um, sent out to the whole of Swedish population. Every household in Sweden got this uh, brochure, and it says, if crisis or war comes, and it's basically a manual to every citizen about how to handle themselves in the worst, uh, if, if the worst uh, situation should come. And that underlines one important thing, I would say, and that is that civil preparedness starts with personal preparedness. So everyone needs to, for example, the recommendation from, from the agency in Sweden is that every Swede that under normal circumstances, not having support from society, should be able to cope for at least a week without electricity, without the possibility of buying food, not having uh, a sufficient amount of, 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 of water the regular way. And I would say this personal uh, preparedness also connects to how we need to be thinking uh, with our act in the cyber domain, because every single actor needs to take their responsibility in you know, laying the groundwork of their, their uh, cybersecurity because states cannot in themselves take all that responsibility. States need to uh, uh, help, help all actors in society to work with their uh, cyber defense and cyber security, but every single actor needs to do their job. And I think that uh, also underscores why it is of utmost importance that the NIS2 directive comes into play in every uh, European country right now. So this is a Swedish manual in how to respond to a crisis. Did you put your telephone number in it? <laughs> I'm not sure that my telephone number is the one that is adequate, but <laughs> on the back of this folder, uh, there is a number of, of telephone numbers, namely uh, the, the ones to call for, for rescue services and to get in contact with healthcare, for example. And okay. that, that is very important. You mentioned um, energy security and security of energy uh, uh, networks and, and supply. Uh, another um, element that the Ukraine uh, war has shown is the, the importance of communication uh, channels. Um, and obviously this has been a very specific target of uh, the Russian military as well in Ukraine. It was one of the first targets with the cyber attack preceding the actual invasion. Uh, and it continues to be a very important element of resilience for the Ukrainians. How do you look at the resilience of communication networks in your own country, and what are you doing to actually increase uh, resilience there? Well, first of all, I would like to say that the examples from Ukraine also underlines the importance of having good friends in times like these. Because Ukraine has done a heroic jobs uh, on their own, but they've also had good help from like-minded countries along Europe. And I think that's very important, and that is something to build build on for the future. And uh, you're touching upon a, a very important question because I think that for we need to be able to build in more of, of a redundancy and have backup plans should the worst thing happens because obviously society in many ways is simpler today than it was 20 or 30 years ago but is also more, vo more vulnerable and the risk of uh, cascade effects, if not handled correctly, is of course much greater. Mm -hmm. Part of your ministry also deals with, um, um, part of your services also deals with something called psychological defense. Uh, this is a specific uh, part of the, of the uh, Ministry of Defense. I wanted to ask, um, how do you deal with this concept of psychological defense? Because I think for a lot of citizens, this is something new that you also have to uh, get them um, engaged in and, and explain what the, what the idea here is. 
Yeah, and I, I, I understand that psychological defense might sound scary to, <laughs> to some people when they hear, hear it for the first time, but this basically is about handling malign uh, information uh, activities or campaigns directed towards, in this case, our countries from other state actors or state-like actors. And we, of course, need to know that a big part of uh, the attack vector in the cyber domain is information campaigns. And we also need to realize that adversaries and antagonists are using information campaigns to reach certain political goals or stop countries from doing uh, s certain things. And we have, a, we have a agency specially directed towards that threat towards our country to help other agencies to, to be able to cope with, with these type of disinformation campaign or malign information campaigns. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite important. And, and I mean, the last, the last decade shows that this part of the cyber domain has, has grown and, and will probably continue to grow. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the importance of having good friends, um, and I would be remiss as a journalist not to ask you about NATO membership, uh, because Sweden obviously has applied for NATO membership, and that application is now pending uh, decision. Finland joined uh, formally yesterday. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, what do you see in the coming weeks? What is your hopes, and what are your expectations for that membership in the coming weeks? Well, let me first of all say, say reiterate my congratulations to, to Finland. Europe is safer already with, with Finland on board, and we, of course, hope that our uh, uh, NATO accession process can, can be finalized as soon as possible, of course. Uh, and that is, of course, not only of self-interest, but due to the fact that we truly see that Sweden can bring something to the, to the table, both, both in, in terms of our military capabilities, but, of course, uh, also in terms of building resilience living up to the seven baseline requirements, but also bringing something to the, to the table. We've been working with civil defense since the end of World War II, and uh, I would say that we are quite good at it. Is that something that NATO uh, members can also learn from, that model within the government that maybe perhaps see more ministers of civil defense pop up? Well, it's, it's of course not up to me to, to say how other uh, uh, countries should dis dispose their, their governments in terms of ministerial portfolios, but I think for sure that every European country needs to work with uh, whole of society resilience. Because as I, as, I, as I said when we sat down here, no society is stronger than its weakest links. The weak link will be, be exploited by by an adversary. Let's maybe quickly look at um, an element of great stress on societies, which is oftentimes uh, periods of elections. Uh, so when elections happen, oftentimes there are increasing threats or increasing challenges, both in terms of resilience, but also in terms of misinformation, in terms of uh, working with society to think about security issues. Um, and I wanted to ask you, obviously Sweden's had an election last year, uh, but we're also going into a European Parliament election next year, uh, and Sweden, of course, being a, being a member country. Uh, so how are you, what have you learned from, from the last experience, and, and how are you preparing uh, in terms of resilience towards the European uh, elections next year? Yeah, that, that, that is where uh, the Agency for Psychological Defense comes into play, basically, and they have a special monitoring missions for, for uh, assessing uh, uh, election campaigns, because that is, of course, uh, uh, like a pivotal moment in terms of, 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 of events that can be uh, affected by information, uh, information campaigns. So I think that now we have another tool in our toolbox that is, is um, very, well suit, very well suited to have for, for uh, the environment that we, are, that we are facing today. And they will work with the, uh, the Swedish part of the election to the European Parliament, and they will work with the uh, general ele election in Sweden. Great. Minister, I'd like to thank you for the conversation. Very interesting. And with that, I will uh, give the floor back to Adria. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen.